What's up, peers, and welcome to join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. And today I'm extraordinarily excited uh, to invite to the show the one and only Dan Gould, who has been working on Bitcoin projects for a while now, starting with Tumblebit, uh, which was a privacy preserving, well, coin tumbling implementation. Uh, and uh, now he is working on Chaincase, which is a mobile iOS application that wraps the Wasabi software magic. Uh, so to provide you with high network level and blockchain privacy uh, on iOS uh, by default, which is absolutely fantastic. And he did a task that I've heard Nopara probably say 101 times that it's impossible. And that is to get a Tor natively integrated into an iOS application. And that is a, a great uh, novel step uh, that other Bitcoin wallet projects can use now. Uh, and it's it's really fantastic uh, to see how much uh, good things are going on, especially in with this iOS application. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And as usual, uh, check out the new podcastapps.com uh, for downloading a podcatcher like Breeze uh, that works with podcasting 2.0 uh, so that you can toss some sats uh, to this great conversation. Uh, and without any further ado, uh, let's get into it. So Dan, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well, Max. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I've listened to a lot of your podcasts, and uh, I always learn something new. So if I can't get something out of you today, something new, uh, hopefully you can get something out of me. Oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thanks very much. And also, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious uh, because you are rather young and have already a whole bunch of contributions to the Bitcoin and free software space under the belt. How did you get into all of this? Why did you start to tinker it? Uh, free software has always been interesting to me just because of how much value is created and then able to be iterated on. Um, you know, it, it exists kind of parallel or outside of traditional uh, copyright. So they came together at kind of the same time. Uh, while I was at Boston University, I really wanted to contribute to free software or really make my full first pull request on GitHub. And my teaching assistant at the time, Ethan Hillman, was working on Tumblebit and it had some issues and I just edited a config and then he pulled me into the project. He said, come work on it. That's how it all started. Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, and so then tell me a bit more about Tumblebit. What was so intriguing about this project? So Tumblebit is a payment hub and traditional coin mixer that worked with the existing rules of Bitcoin. And I'd found out about Bitcoin a few years before I started contributing to the software, but it was clear that if it's censorship resistant, it's going to need to have privacy at some point. And the fact that they demonstrated this with, I believe it was 400 peers um, with their prototype, totally fascinated me. and. The fact that it was just happening, you know, by the people that were teaching me probability was doubly fascinated and, and I needed to be involved. So Tumblebit is a little bit different from a coin join in that it has a funding transaction and a, an like exit transaction, a closing transaction, similar to Lightning Network. It's more like payment channels. Um, and for that reason, I think it was too expensive to succeed in production, but it let me get my feet wet in solving the problem that is financial privacy uh, generally and Bitcoin privacy specifically. Yeah, so let's talk a bit more about the privacy of Tumblebit because I think it's extremely interesting and very useful to understand with, with potentially in the future, very interesting ways that it can actually be used profitably and effectively. Uh, so tell us a bit more about the client-server relationship in Tumblebit. So it's similar to the central coordination of Wasabi, but instead of just blind signatures, you have a, a secret, uh, you have puzzle administration, and then the puzzles are solved for, um, and this happens as an off-chain exchange. So you sort of exchange value at off-chain, but you can, you can have a voucher for the value you put into the payment channel at a later time. 
okay, so you you quote unquote deposit some money into this uh, payment app, and at a later point you can withdraw the money. Um, now that kind of sounds at first like some custodial scheme. So what happens with your money after you put it in? Who can spend it? Is there someone else than you that can spend your Bitcoin? So you put your money into a time lock contract. And for doing that, you also get a, um, I should say Alice locks her money in a time lock contract and receives a solution for a puzzle that would release that. And then the puzzle is given to Bob on the other side. And then Alice and Bob communicate out of band. So Alice, if she gets paid by Bob, will, instead of sending Bitcoin, give release the solution to the puzzle. And then Bob can release the funds without having any connection between them on chain. So like that um, solution exchange would happen over a Tor circuit. Uh -huh. so, so Alice has a secret, basically. And if, and, Whoever knows the secret can spend the Bitcoin off this payment hub channel. Uh, and now if Alice gives that secret over to Bob, then of course he can spend those Bitcoin. Um, but how about double spending? Because Alice still knows that secret. And so she could still spend those Bitcoin. Yeah, I think the reason that this uh protocol never really took off is because it's so complicated to explain and i'm not even sure that i actually grasp it enough to explain it to someone else but, but from what i remember the secrets given to alice blinded so alice can actually send the secret while it's still blinded um along with some verification that it's accurate from the coordinator server or the tumbler i guess we'd call it in tumblebit and then bob would be able to unblind that and receive the payment. Okay, I see. So the, the coordinating server here, again, protects the double spending risk, so to say. Insofar as it issues a, a blind signature, but I'm, I don't believe that you have to trust the coordinator server not to reveal that information. Okay, I see. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, and the coordinating server himself cannot spend those Bitcoin at all. I don't believe so, no. Only... Only the person who gets the solution to the puzzle, who for some reason cannot by the, be the coordinator. I wish I had the paper in front of me. I really, I can't recall. Yeah, the nuances of these things are, are always very tricky, right? But um, how, so in, the, for example, the Lightning Network, right? Both parties or any side of any one party can open a channel to the other one, right? So, uh, is that the same case in Tumblebit? Or does the user always have to open, uh, so to say, the, that payment hub to the server? I think the user has to open to the the payment hub. It's It has um, epochs in the same way that CoinJoin does. So like, there's a period of time when you can uh, create a funding transaction. And then some eight hours later, uh, the funds will be moved into an, an escrow that the blind signature can then pull them from. Okay, interesting. And so how does anonymity set calculation come into this whole picture? Like, what is your actual privacy here? So I think you'd use standard denominations as well. And then it's just however many standard denominations uh, come into the fray. But rather than give a standard denomination per user, the standard denomination is given per puzzle so like a user can register um some inputs and get multiple puzzles and solutions for for that to stream them in in standard denominations uh -huh. yeah i see um and uh, like how f how fast uh is this whole process not fast uh <laughs> i it's always an issue of coordination right if like everyone's on online I don't believe you need too much time, but if you're trying to coordinate uh, liquidity, that's always the constraint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so here then also in a sense, right? The more users there are, the more liquidity there is, and then the better your anonymity set and therefore your privacy, as well as the faster the communication time or the, or the coordination time for the whole ceremony. Yeah, it's the problem we keep running into. Um, I think anyone trying to bring privacy to Bitcoin is running into the 
the problem of coordinating users together, like trading off speed for fees for privacy. Yeah, yeah, and that's really, I think, the, the triangle here. Uh, speed, fee, privacy, and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to optimize for all three of them. Yeah, which makes Wabi Sabi particularly interesting, I think. Um, like the second generation coin join, if you if you can batch payments through a coin join, you may be able to improve greatly on the existing constraints with uh, with speed and fees, right? Because if you can have peers that are doing payments through what's essentially a batch transaction, you can approach the same costs that an exchange would get from batching. Yes, right. The The idea is to have as little on-chain transactions as reasonable, right? And he, that starts with something like, for example, Tumblebit that has how many on-chain transactions for a successful ceremony? Mm, success, I believe, is two. It might be three. I need to look. I know if it fails, it's four. Or right. it can be up to four, which is very painful. Yeah, exactly, right? And four across multiple like a across a long time period, but with with a rather high confirmation uh, uh, time preference, right? Because you, I, I, if I understand correctly, you do need to have transactions confirmed quickly. Um, is that all right, or, or is that correct? Like in the sense that uh, uh, there are also these justice or punishment transactions. Uh, there are definitely punishment transactions where it's like after a certain threshold after your time lock is up uh if the solution to the secret isn't revealed if you don't have a valid transaction spending the escrow then it can be clawed back um, so it's not stuck in this escrow phase from the coordinator yes right that's that's quite a common thing uh in in these second layer protocols or, or other protocols but again right if if you have to have a transaction in the blockchain before a certain point then this is a rather high time preference, I think, right? Um, so in in that sense, then not just you have four transactions, but you have four transactions where you are likely going to have to pay in the top percentile of the Bitcoin fee rate currently of other competing transactions. And that ca tends to get a, a quite, quite expensive. Right? And L Lightning Network kind of improves the situation to an extent, right? That you only have two on-chain transactions. I well know in the uncooperative case, there are more transactions still. Well, but still, one of the beauties of CoinJoin, and I know that this was one of the reasons why uh, Nopara uh, stopped uh, working on Tumblebit, uh, was because CoinJoin is m is done in one single transaction, right? The, the entire privacy ceremony is atomic in one single transactions. Sure, there's benefits if you do multiple privacy ceremonies, multiple coin joins and you remix, but fundamentally everything is done in one transaction. And this is of course, well, much better than four transactions in the worst case uh, of, of Tumblebit. Yeah, I, there's an awesome pictograph at the end of that paper that shows all of the outcomes. And there are just so many different ways for it to go. And then you are worried about I think it's not it's not even just like one side worry about um like punishment transaction getting in in time or or avoiding that even if you have a proper payout you still need that to confirm before the other person can claw it back um yeah i've been much less focused on payment hubs and even lightning honestly because coin join is so simple in comparison so i can mm -hmm. wrap my head around it and the others are difficult for me yes and then even if you look into the nuances of coin join it still gets very very complex yeah absolutely absolutely even the standard denomination ones there are so many nuances mm -hmm. yes uh but to let's focus one more time on the the privacy of uh tumblebit in the sense that what does the server know about the customers mm, i mean it was never run in production so feasibly nothing uh, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm thinking because I, I believe, if I remember correctly, that it is that the server knows that there are user transactions going on, but he cannot link the quote unquote deposit to the withdrawal of the uh, Tumble Bit Hub 
um, to one user. So it's a bit similar to a coin drawing coordinator not being able to link inputs to outputs uh, of a single coin drawing transaction. The TumblePit coordinator cannot link the the deposit and the withdrawal transaction, so to say. Yeah, it's unlinkable in the same way. You're not trusting TumbleBit to uh, whoever's running the coordinator to obfuscate your transactions. It's all happening with the protocol. Okay, but then what does an outside observer see? So if you're not the coordinator, can you still find out that there is a TumbleBit transaction going on? I think so. The two transactions are unordinary. They're They're definitely using scripts that are unlike other transactions that you'd uh you'd see in heuristics or you'd see like typical transactions that would just be a, a pay to script hash like that's not what's going on yeah and then so so here we see right there there are somewhat similar potential privacy benefits than with a coin join but well ultimately many more transactions than a coin join has so this is, or it tends to be an unfavorable trade-off. And as you mentioned, since TumbleBit never even made it into production uh, and for sure is not running right now, I think this is somewhat of a, of a proof that it's just not good enough uh, in the trade-offs. Yeah, it's not worth posting multiple transactions that have uh, like multiple potential outputs. They're, they're just huge transactions to begin with, like uh, 700 bits or something, 700 bytes. and. Yeah, anyone can see you're doing it, and you don't blend in with other people doing coin join. Uh, like all the coin joins are relatively similar, right? Yeah, um, and so I'm I'm curious because you were very closely involved with. Remind me, what's it called? Uh, um, the the company oh, Stratus. Stratus, yes, yeah, exactly. Stratus Starts with an S two. A, a different Breeze wallet to what we're uh, what we've been graced with now. Uh, yeah, Stratus tried to put together TumbleBit in a desktop client software, um, but they didn't want to run the coordinator. So that that was the nail in the coffin. If you're not going to be able to run the software, how are people going to use it? Aha, uh -huh. that's interesting, right? So there is a company that was interested in, in researching and even developing the software uh, of this privacy implementation, but then ultimately they were not wanting to run the infrastructure that coordinates these things. Now, why do you think that they were hesitant to do that? To me, it's it has to be that the guidance didn't come out. The 2019 FinCED guidance made things more clear for everyone in the space, um, in particular, a distinction between anonymizing software and anonymizing money service businesses, right? One, like the, the former, if you're running a software protocol is not the acceptance and transmission of funds, but uh, a money service like what I believe Michael Harmon was running with, uh, what was it, Helix? Was, you know, that was clearly defined uh, in the 2019 guidance before that it was not clear. It was not as clear, you know, what was acceptable and considered non-threatening. Yeah, and that's, that's good that there's some more clarity uh, in the... the you know, the, the legalities of running such coordination services, right, that are fundamentally, you know, just uh, one person relaying information from left to right. Uh, so yeah, there's really not much crime going on here uh, in, in any real sense of the word. None at all, right. So then uh, the, the, we've we've covered some of the reasons why Tumblebit is interesting, but yet still why it, why it fails. And then... Out of these realizations, Nopara started to working on Hidden Wallet, which is that precursor of Wasabi Wallet that then implements these zero-link coin join um, transactions. When did you hear about this project and what were your initial thoughts on it? Oh, I knew about Hidden Wallet, I think, very close to the beginning because myself and uh, Nicolas Dorier and Adam all had some input in Stratus and Tumblebit, and I knew he went on for Hidden Wallet right away. I remember when the initial Hidden Wallet uh, like release happened and when he coordinated on Twitter and offered to give people $10 uh, 
for their participation and then it was really funny because in the article he's like i'll give you ten dollars but if you don't want my ten dollars please don't take my ten dollars i i don't have ten dollars to send you like it was early days <laughs> it, was, it was cool <laughs> yeah that's actually a, a fun incentivization uh, to to uh, get early testers uh to offer them some money but then hope that they don't take it paid acquisition but like yeah also a donation at the same time i don't know it was yeah it was genius because it got off the ground right yeah right and the initial bootstrapping is is a difficult challenge right it really is uh you know uh how are you gonna get the first person of a crowd together right if there's just one person well it's no crowd um but then after the second one comes in it, it starts to look better but yeah it's, it's a very difficult step that's zero to one mm, yeah it's always the second guy dancing that starts the crowd not the first yeah exactly <laughs> um and so like were you just interested or, or curious in the project or did you also you know contribute uh you know actual code uh, or you know research ideas to it which project hidden wallet hidden wallet i was mostly a bystander i was paying attention to tumblebit still at the time working with stratus contributing there um i was definitely on twitter and involved with those early mixes and the hype around them you know as a, as a tester a little bit but that was about the extent of it it's not until things really became wasabi and established that i was closely following the project mm -hmm. yeah uh, i see that's nice um and then uh, when uh, did you realize that there are some problems in wasabi that nobody is addressing and that you have a potential to fix i mean in, in using it right like to me it just made no sense to not have mobile capability um doing some overseas travel it made so much sense to me just abundantly clear if you're in a different country or moving between places that use different currencies that you want to be able to take that with you on the devices that you're going to have with you or be able to at least interact that way not necessarily uh, rely on your security that way so that was like that was the major flaw i'd witnessed and then just being in the tumblebit chat seeing what users complain about and talking to them um seeing the criticism come in as well i think you know there's there's founded and unfounded criticism but the biggest issue is it's just hard to use right you still can shoot yourself in the foot um hopefully 2.0 fixes that yeah so those are i think that the two big problems that you really hit hit on the head one is that uh you know the the desktop reliance uh that's i mean both you know a, just a regular feature of being a desktop wallet but also of course a hindrance now again as i said in the intro i should have counted the number of times that nopara told me that a mobile wasabi is impossible <laughs> so w what was the reasons why he was so skeptical why do you think did he think that this is an almost unsurmountable task well, I think he was right because it took me, I don't know, four or five months, probably. It wasn't full-time work at that time, but it was like something I was hammering away on to to figure it out. Um, the biggest reason that he probably thought that was impossible is because the Tor project, the people funded by the Tor project to build something into iOS weren't able to build it into a VPN. There were memory limitations. And then the thing they actually came out with uh, could only be run on a single thread because you can't fork a process in ios um at least not not like tor something that would just run alongside the application so there are serious technical constraints that apple places on you um within ios and I, we're still facing them definitely um it's not like the beta product is n not as stable as tor on the desktop is but i think we've come to a place where it's usable and that's what's most important uh -huh. so so tor really was the the big bottleneck and you you said that you know the tor project tried to run something like orbot at which is one application that you install on the phone and then other applications route their internet traffic through your application and that's how for example orbot works on android quite well uh, i would say um, but but you chose a different approach, right? To to not have a separate app that runs the Tor, but 
to run within the actual wallet application uh, right there run the tor process alongside uh, so how did you actually manage to do that yeah so if we were to run it in a separate app i think the only way to do that with ios would be a network extension or to package it as a phony vpn and tor uses too much memory for either of those to not be killed by the operating system so what we did is the same approach as onion browser on ios which is to run the whole tor process on a single thread and to interact with the wasabi code we wrapped it with uh, bindings for c sharp so the whole thing can be controlled in the same code base that is taking care of the validation and the coin join protocol and um yeah, it starts and stops every time you open the app, which is crazy to think about. But it, that even can be hidden in some ways with proper UI because you don't really need the network until you're sending a payment, right? Or until you uh, you want to check that you have your balance. So if you need to wait 20 seconds in the background for Tor to start up, you know, it might take you that long to scan in an address before you get there as a long-winded answer. Uh -huh. So when when does Tor actually need to shut down? When you just minimize the app and the different app is running in the foreground or when you actually force close the app? Yeah, when you actually just minimize the app. And uh, iOS is called backgrounding. Um, everything is supposed to be able to run indefinitely as part of their guidelines. So that makes other things like uh, push notifications at least with the current architecture, impossible to receive over Tor. Although maybe someone will prove me wrong, like I proved Nopar wrong and it won't be impossible shortly. Uh -huh. And so how do you go, with, or I mean, a more broader question is because Wasabi on desktop runs only through Tor, right? Everything goes through Tor uh, and, and nothing by default touches ClearNet. But how is that going on iOS? Like, can you really be 100% Tor only? Well, right now we are. Right now we are 100% Tor only, but everything from syncing to sending payments to uh, CoinJoin protocol has to happen while the app is in the foreground. Um, that's the that's the main constraint. We'd like to keep it that way. We don't use push notifications right now. We use something called like local notifications. So it's the app itself schedules, but there are all sorts of limitations. The main one is that you can't open the app in the background without a push notification um so that means you can't open the app to coin join when it's time to coin join in the background there's some interesting workarounds that we're looking into but that's that's the beta state of things okay so with these push notifications potentially the app could do more computation without the graphical user interface actually showing on screen yeah push notification would allow the app to wake up in the background at which time we could boot tour and then I think we're limited to two or three minutes, but that should be enough to do output registration and signing. Aha, uh -huh. so with these push notifications, you get to actually run the software in the background you know, properly uh, and connect to the internet and do the coordination that needs to be done. Otherwise the operating system will give you like a random interval like instagram for example i think like if you use it then it, like it depends how frequently you pick up the app if you pick the up app if you pick the app up frequently it'll allow um the app to fetch information say twice an hour but you can't decide when that happens that happens based on how hot the phone is how much memory is being used how much cpu is being used it's all like really managed so, but if we had push notifications, we would be able to to trigger that in the background. And, you know, I think Apple, I don't know if you heard about their, what's essentially a proxy service, um, but I think they're headed in the right direction to allow privacy for those things. It might be that things are still exposed to Apple, um, but it, even then there are workarounds like we could send push notifications to everyone who signed up for a week, right? And then we would have a larger anonymity set than if we just sent push notifications to people who were participating in a particular coin join round. Um, does that make sense? Yes. So, so right now in these local notifications, 
the the client only receives those notifications when he's actually registered for CoinJoin. But then if you would use the, this this proxy, every user would get these notifications always. And therefore the anonymity set is no longer just the users of this one round, but every user who has the app. Well, right now the notifications users get don't come from our server or Apple server. They come just from the app itself. And because of that, uh, they don't allow computation. So it'll show the pop-up and it'll say open, but it won't be able to trigger any computation in the background. If we actually push from a server, then it would be able to, which is why you would be able to say, push to all the users who um, opted in for notifications for a week. And then only if they had a desire to, like if they had queued for the next coin join around, then it would trigger uh, toward a launch and the, the computation. Otherwise they would just basically stay asleep. It would receive the notification, do one conditional expression, you know, say, you know, does this user want to coin join or not? And then go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but then, right, because there is no base layer <laughs> Tor integration on iOS that can be used across apps, right? And and even when it's in the background, then at least these notifications will be through some clear net, maybe through this Apple proxy, but not as good as it could have been. No, which is why I think we the only way to uh, get them out there would be to send them out to everyone, right? Like if we were only triggering them to people who are participating in a coin join, I, I don't, I think we'd be doing them a disservice to their privacy, but I, I'm not a hundred percent sure because it may be that users are willing to trade off the convenience, even ones that are, you know, totally educated on the subject. They're willing to trade some network level privacy for on-chain permanent record privacy. That's yet to be seen. Okay. And so right now you use this Tor, this inbuilt Tor daemon um, qu quite powerfully because I mean, you know, Wasabi and these coin joints are quite heavy um, and you generate three independent Tor identities uh, to talk to the coordinator about different pieces of information. So how does the performance check out here? Uh, are the phones powerful enough to do that? Yeah, I think anything that's probably an iPhone 7 and above is going to have no problem. Um, I've heard of people using older than that. It's kind of nice that all the hardware is standard. Um, so, you know, there aren't that many environments comparatively that you have to test for. But Tor runs, it's a full Tor uh, executable, you know, that, that runs on one thread. So it is all controlled or the circuits go through the, the Tor Sox proxy, proxy the same way they do in Wasabi to create those uh, identities. It works pretty nice. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. And I mean, it, it seems like such a major thing, right? Because even the official core, Tor project contributors didn't figure this out. Like, do you think that there will be demand from other people to just use that uh, Tor library that you built? Yeah, I because the library... I built is specifically C sharp. I haven't seen anyone trying to use it yet. I have seen people doing uh, similar things with React. The guys at the Saphir.io are doing good work with that. I think we're going to see it in uh, Cypher Node. I think Blue Wallet is taking it on now too. Um, even I think Zeus Wallet has some Tor integration. But I think we, I really have to give a hat tip to Wasabi for having their library uh you know operate through socks so reliably because that is that is what lets us do all the magic yes right it, it really has to be incredibly reliable because you know even if 99 percent of the users talk correctly if one out of them does not then the entire coin join fails for everyone right so reliability is a huge issue and i remember the times where we were stuck forever at 12 to 13 and on set coin joins because as soon as the 14th guy registered <laughs> everything just did no longer work um and then we did some major refactoring and upgrade of tor and all of a sudden it it jumped up to 40 or 50 and on set i feel like i was an absent for that set time i didn't know about that yeah um i i yeah i still have nightmares of 12 peers registered <laughs> 12 out of 20 it always was i believe well, um, so, but there are m even more cool things that you could possibly do with this Tor library. So what other things do you have in mind? 
Yeah, I'm really excited about uh, what our team did at the MIT Bitcoin Hackathon. And I have to thank the organizers for putting that on. But I was fortunate to work with Ron Stoner, head of security at CASA, Armin Sabori, full stack engineer at CASA, and John Zbahari, who's sponsored by Square Crypto to work on the design guide to work on PayJoin. We called our project Onion78 because we've got Tor and the BIP78 standard. Um, what having Tor controlled by the Chaincase app lets us do is open a hidden service. And that means the mobile phones with Chaincase can communicate peer to peer. So they can do interactive protocols. And with regard to the hackathon and pay join, what we did with that was have the sender and receiver of a transaction both contribute inputs so that we break common input ownership heuristic. So if coin or uh, blockchain analysis is looking at the history, it's not sure if inputs, two inputs to a transaction come from the same user or different users any longer. And it provides privacy to people, which is beautiful. There are a number of other things that I think we can do with it. Basically any interactive protocol that happens within a limited amount of time. Uh, I'm really excited about what's going to be possible. And then especially since it's just Tor, so we should be able to interoperate with Wasabi and with BTC Pay Server and um, with Blue Wallet and all sorts of wallets who are integrating. It's really exciting. Yeah, it really is. And again, a, a major breakthrough in use cases that all of a sudden it is possible on an iPhone to be reachable through a hidden service from anywhere on the world. Right? That's that's quite an incredible use case, actually. And I mean, you, you bring up PayJoin as, as one of the well already established real use cases that can be done with that on a Bitcoin layer. But, you know, the possibilities are, are really, really far reaching. Yeah, I saw someone talking about how much we need dual funded lightning channels. And although Chaincase doesn't support lightning yet, I think we're going to see it in a mobile wallet in the future where we're able to communicate on a peer to peer basis and negotiate a, a dual funded channel. Um, I'm definitely no authority on the dual funded channel requirements, like what that protocol actually looks like. But it's my understanding that if the two can communicate and interact, you can uh, both participate like that off chain. Yeah. So dual funding means that m m multiple or both parties of a lightning channel provide coins in the input of the opening transaction. So it's it's literally a coin join and it has a minimum of, of two users, right? But um, there is one interesting tip that Rusty Russell gave in our conversation on the Wasabikas podcast as well. And this is that when you coordinate these dual funded channel openings, you can also include other inputs and outputs from other third party users that are not even part of this channel factory as uh, this this uh, this one single channel that is dual funded. Um, so I think that it might even be possible right, that you can dual. F so when Alice proposes to open a channel to Bob, then and she su she suggests Bob to also provide inputs uh, into this opening transaction then Bob can, of course, provide his own coins right, that he can spend um, and that he then wants to put into this opening transaction. B but in theory, he could also provide coins that he does not even control, um, especially those coins from other Wasabi coin joint users. Right? So that we actually get the combination of a dual funded lightning channeling opening coin join with a regular multi-user coin join uh, as we see them in wasabi uh, and yeah th those are just you know some of the possibilities uh, that we have here i'm trying to understand what you mean by that bob instead of receiving a transaction at a, an address he owns just funds like ask someone to fund this other uh transaction with multiple inputs um it's bob does not use those utxos of other people to increase the balance of his lightning channel Right. So for example, so Alice says, Hey, Bob, I want to, you know, open a, a payment channel to you worth 0 0.1 Bitcoin. And then Bob says, well, great. I, I like that. Thank you. But you know what? I will also add 0 0.1 Bitcoin from my side. 
Okay. So both of us now provide a 0.1 Bitcoin input and we get on the output side um, 0.2 Bitcoin, right? In the multi-sig channel. But both Alice and Bob, of course, also have to be able to provide change outputs, right? So um, output addresses that are not in the two of two multi-signature of the Lightning channel, but that are just on regular single sig uh, addresses. Um, and so therefore, in theory, what they can just say um, is that, so I want to provide this 0.1, you know, input for myself, but then I also want to provide this five Bitcoin input, this three Bitcoin input, this 2.5 and these other 10 inputs, right? And they can just be part of the opening transaction. If also, if in the output side, then there are all the addresses from the other coin join users that are not aware of this lightning channel, basically of this negotiation. Um, so these inputs and outputs are basically just treated as, as change, so to say, in, in f for the context of the two users that actually communicate the opening of this dual funded channel. They're probably much more sophisticated and well thought, thought through protocols that would enable to open lightning channels in a coin join. Um, but well, so far, I don't think that too many people have th thought about it or actually implemented it. Um, but do you think that you guys at Chaincase are going to be one of them? Like is Lightning Network on your list of to-dos? Well, before we get there, I think it's, I think I want to touch on one other thing you can do having the interactivity between the wallets, which is have a sort of contacts list. Like if you have a hidden service associated with a contact that becomes a, a alternative for an address. If your hidden service can negotiate addresses on your part, you can have a different uh, a derivation path for each person in your contacts. And as long as you're online, they can contact you and pay you on a fresh address. But it also has that requirement where you're online. So you don't worry about uh, expiration of that contact. Like if it expires, you just can't pay them. You can't, you can't send to an address that they might not be in control of anymore. And um, I think that has implications for not only privacy, but also people accepting Bitcoin payments who aren't able to run a full BTC pay server, for example. Yeah, I think this is really one of the huge unsolved problems, uh, how to generate an address for someone else right? and uh, how to do that, you know, efficiently and, and securely. Um, and maybe let's walk through a couple of the possible ways. Like, what do you think about uh, these Diffie-Hellman key exchange type of deals, um, like what's it called? BIP something something. <laughs> but the, the, these uh, paynims, yes. I'm not sure. I haven't I haven't used it. The one problem that I've been that I understand. Well, there's a couple problems I I understand that have been uh, relayed by Yuval Cogman. He's helped me understand a little bit. Um, is that you have to post on chain. Right, but that's not the end of the world. We all post on chain to transact, and then because your NIM is on chain, you can't expire it, um, or at least not easily. So those seem to be the the issues. And the other issues is just not it's not supported. Um, most wallets aren't looking for that. Yeah, I don't know. It seems to solve a problem for a lot of people, right? People do rave about it, but I haven't not used it yet. Yeah, I, again, like it, it solves the problem of generating an address of someone else, right? Uh, it does, and 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 that's yeah, that's a big problem. Um, so yes, but there there are trade offs, right? So one of the thing is that you need to have a shared secret among a group of two users, right? And so then the question is, uh, you know, how do you back that up? Um, and the reason that it's implemented in in uh, somewhere is that there are there you make an on-chain transaction with a op return um with the secret uh and there are the addresses of the two users in this transaction as well so that when a wallet downloads all of the bitcoin transactions that have addresses of them referenced one of those many transactions will then be the transactions that references the secret 
of this Diffie Hellman key exchange. Um, so that's a that's a backup solution, right? On how to remember all those secrets that the other person or that you generated together with the other person. Um, and I mean, that's, you know, that's an interesting trade-off. You, you spend more money on transaction fees because transaction size gets larger, but in exchange, you get a very secure and robust recovery way so that you will very likely always find all of your coins. Um, and you don't have to make new backups of all these keys that you shared with your counterparties. Mm, critical that we have at both full backups and disaster recovery. It's one thing I am concerned about with any wallet attempting privacy is I don't think we have great solutions for backing up all the metadata like labels and the participation in CoinJoin. And I don't know that that can all be, you know, it can't be gathered with on-chain information. So I think that needs to be improved as well. Before we get to things like Lightning, I don't know. I need help with with that. That's something that Chaincase definitely needs help with. So that might also be a blind spot just because of who's currently working on it, you know? Yeah, so one of the ways that backups, you know, could be done uh, is to just, you, especially when you're on the phone, is to use the inbuilt cloud storage application, you know, in the iPhone case, just the Apple iCloud. Um, and, you know, if even possible to encrypt those backups with the Bitcoin, you know, the 12 Bitcoin recovery words. Yeah. And we're doing that. Not exactly with the 12 recovery words, but with a, like an intermediate key. I think you can definitely encrypt it before it gets to iCloud. You should. And then it'll be there for users. And I think uh, Moonwallet's doing a pretty good job with this right now. Yeah. Okay. So that's great that you already do it. And then how frequently do you update those backups? So we have a pull request that just outlines the encryption, but if you were to do it practically, I think every time you generate a key, you'd have to back up again. That's the issue. It would need to be totally synchronized, uh, unlike a disaster recovery, 12 words and password, which could be done just once. Yeah. And this is again, one of the issues that Lightning Network is also stumbling over, right? With every new transaction, you have to remember more secret information. And if you forget that information, then in the worst case, you can even lose your money. Uh, so that's not a nice thing. Um, and, you know, in a sense, we have similar things with metadata like labels, right? Every time you generate a new address, you ought to provide a label of who knows that this address is yours. And of course, with every new address that you generate and send out to people, that set of information expands and therefore your updates and your backups should expand as well. Yes, I think labeling has so much potential so much potential for client-side heuristic analysis to give users privacy without the need for a coin join or even with limiting, you know, to save them money. I think we have a lot that can be done with labeling. Yeah, for sure. So how does Chaincase as of now use labeling? So you keep your labels, you can see your labels, but it's not, uh, we aren't using heuristic analysis yet to allow you to select those coins together. I think that could be coming, but you know, we use anonymity set derived with the same algorithm as Wasabi to cluster the coins. Um, we do force labels. I think you have to label, but there's, yeah. there's potential that hasn't been discovered yet in that regard. Yes. And I, I even think that Lucas Antivero made a pull request that does do coin selection where it recognizes or it considers the labels. And if multiple coins have the same label, then it prefers to consolidate those coins rather than to consolidate coins with different labels. Um, and I think that's a very promising idea, but one of the downsides, especially in, in Wasabi right now, is that the labels field is very misused. And people write in there the reason for the payment, like pizza, instead of the observer who knows that about this address, right? Like the, the person who sent you, for example. Uh, or who, who paid you, right? Or the person whom you pay. Um, and the contacts, like a properly implemented contact feature might actually solve that potentially dangerous flaw, right? If, if you have a better way to, to find out whose address is this, um, and who is being paid, then this might be 
you know more more reliable uh so maybe let's go a bit deeper into context like wh what are you thinking about there uh, how would you like to implement it yeah i think what we have now is kind of a primitive implementation of that where we you know i think we give a little more guidance than wasabi and that we say like this is a label you want to label this from the person that you're interacting with so that you can make better decisions informed later on but if we had a standard contact scheme like bip 21 then you could both autofill those fields when you scan an invoice and select coins if you had coins that or outputs that were only known by your counterparty, you could suggest those. Um, or you could coin join with the target specifically to keep the information away from a particular label. Um, you know, get a certain number of anon set away from them. One other thing is when you have a context, context field, then you could also add these different ways that you can generate addresses for that contact right so that might be for example this diffie hellman Paynim key exchange mm -hmm. um it might be an xpub right for example um or it might be this hidden service right that where where you do the pay to endpoint um and if you then have a well-defined contact as well as a way to get addresses for this I think that would improve the user experience uh, as, as well by quite a lot. Yeah, definitely. John Spahari has probably done more preliminary work on this than anyone else I know uh, in the design guide. And it's an issue of like, like when you're talking about generating different addresses or PayNim or Tor endpoint for user, I think you're adding friction by forcing a decision. Um, so overcoming that problem and coming up with some default is what I hope we can get to, but it's really concerning. You know, as the world gets more complex, what we need is for experts to have have suggestions. You know, be able to to have some some guidance. I think, and that's what's missing. Yeah, that's true. Um... I think the optionality, of course, it's important to have the optionality. Like, and that's what's beautiful about free software. You can run your own, but for most of the people I know that use money which is everyone they don't want to make decisions about how the transaction happens they reach for the easiest thing and want to get want to exchange you know their saved uh value for some good or service and that's it they don't want to think about it yeah that's that's very true right and the more you think about it the higher is your mental transaction costs and the less profitable is then every action that you make yeah that's a good point <laughs> Yeah, really, so it, it's high in Bitcoin right now, right? It's really, it's cool to see it happening in El Salvador, you know, where it's, I don't know if everyone's going to be obliged to use it, but we're going to see it used more widespread. And I think that's going to mean some of these decisions are going to be made. We're going to see the real problems arise, like where, where the default decisions fail, perhaps in privacy, perhaps in custody. Um, and it's going to be a lot of opportunity to solve those problems uh, by reducing the friction, by you know giving people better decision-making frameworks through the way of software. And so how, or f about what parts of chain case are you especially proud in the terms of uh, you know, UX improvement? Hmm. Well, I think the first one that comes to mind is how you confirm your password without even knowing about it. I know multiple people who have forgotten their Wasabi wallet passwords, you know, their, their encryption passwords, because once you set it, you have no uh, incentive to, to remember it, I, I guess. What, what I'm saying is you, you enter it once and you can automatically generate a key in Wasabi, um, from what I understand. I don't know if that's been changed since I've last created a wallet there, but with Chaincase, you have a separate... Uh, login screen that makes sure you know your password in order to generate a receive address and just small things like that have really been a safety for users. Um, other things, I think we show uh, a guidance on labeling quite well. It's improving at least. Um, and just form factor, being able to have it in your pocket. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily a, a 
strict improvement from Wasabi. Of course, we're still beta software and it, it serves a completely different purpose, like a different uh, user who's walking around with Bitcoin in their mobile. And we have a long way to go, but I think there are some things we really have to improve on. Yeah, I would also like to highlight, and that's pretty similar to Wasabi, but noteworthy with Chaincase especially, is that the best UX is Tor because there is literally zero user exp user facing experience at all right it just works and that's, that's the true. best yeah i am excited to bring payjoin to ios because the ux we've devised only opens your hidden service for a few minutes so your experience receiving a payment is nearly identical to a regular you know, generate address and receive payment, except you enter your password. Um, so that UX that's almost not noticeable and would give you a peer-to-peer -peer coin join is also a point of pride. So with PayJoin, because the receiver also provides an input, uh, his own coin uh, in this transaction where he himself gets paid, and because in Wasabi, you can, and therefore Chaincase, you can only spend a coin if you generate if you have the private key but in order to get the private key you need to type in the password so now in chain case if you actually want to receive a pay join then you do need to type in the password just to get the private keys with whom you can then uh spend this coin in your receiving transaction uh like do, do you think that's reasonable for people to you know be in front of the computer ready to type in the password um, you know, as they are getting paid? Uh, well, yes, because the server is not, like, in order to generate the invoice, you have to type in your password beforehand. So you just, in Chaincase, you, or in Onion78, in our proposed pay join implementation, when you wish to generate an invoice for a pay join, you enter the label, and then your password, and then you get a Tor hidden service, with an address, like the whole uh, BIP78 invoice that only lasts for three minutes. And because of the limitations with Tor, it has to stay open, which the use case that makes sense to me, I mean, it, it's no different than than a, a lightning invoice from Strike that's open and available for 90 seconds at a time. And if I send you an invoice on Signal and you know that it's ephemeral, you know, it has an expiration attached to it. I, I think it, it still functions. We will have to see uh, what users think, where they struggle, but I do think it's reasonable. Okay, so you type in the password as you, or after you click the receive button then. Yes, exactly. You click receive, you're asked to label the address, and then when you click next, you enter your password. Once the password's entered, you see a QR code, that you can have your counterparty scan, or you can copy the invoice to your clipboard and shoot it off. Oh, that's interesting. But it's it's quite a different UX than to other Bitcoin wallets, right? because usually if you want to generate a receive address, well, you don't need to type in the password. So there is an associated warning that tells you why you need to write the password, right? Because the alternative would just be run a hot wallet all the time. And I don't think that's acceptable. That's much more dangerous too. So what, what do you mean by hot wallet, right? Is to have the private keys encrypted in clear text stored on the hardware wallet and probably even in RAM. Well, um, they wouldn't even be encrypted, right? Exactly, right? So, so right now in Wasabi, the wallet file, which is stored on the hard drive, uh, has the encrypted secret, right? So this is not your actual private keys, uh, but you still need to type in the passphrase in order to get the actual private keys of your, um, well, th that can spend your Bitcoin. Um, so therefore you only need to type in that password when you actually spend the coins. Right, and in this implementation, you would, you would pull that, uh, pull the private keys in memory for the duration of the hidden service, which is like three minutes or so. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's it's for sure novel again that you have to provide the password just to receive, but I, I understand the trade offs. And although this is not yet well released and finalized, but in Wasabi two point uh, the way we envision it is that actually when you load a wallet, uh, you will have to provide the password, 
and it will decrypt the secrets and then have the the, the clear text um, private key is actually stored in RUM so that you are ready to do coin joins, right? Well, regular Wabi-Sabi coin joins, not, no pay joins, just regular coin joins in the background uh, automatically. Um, but as you say, right, there's the risk of it being a hot wallet. What do you think about it? Uh, it, it depends on, you know, risk tolerance of the users. I think that's going to be, it'd be best if you have some separation where like certain outputs are limited, um, that are spendable. Like you have a distinct set of coins that are okay to coin join rather than being, uh, the secrets for every output that one owns. Yeah, right. That's the question. Do you want to decrypt the X priv, right? So the private key, uh, the master of, of all the other private keys. Um, but if you do that, then of course the entire wallet balance can be spent and maybe it's better to, uh, well, only, you know, only keep the private keys of some UTXOs that you actually intend to, to coin join if you don't intend to coin join those others. Yeah. I know BTC pay for pay join requires a whole distinct hot wallet to always be running. It's yeah, it's, it's a trade-off like anything else. Getting getting the trade-off across to the users if you're going to present them with the decision is maybe more difficult than making the decision for them. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, but I think that the trade-off is much more reasonable in your case of chain case. Uh, because well, you know, it's a mobile wallet, the user is already in front of it. Um, and therefore he can type in the passphrase, right? While, uh, for example, with BTC pay server, uh, the server is running 24 seven all the time, right? And you are not always there to type in the passphrase. Uh, so it's a different, yeah, well, it's a different thing. And, and maybe it's not even a, a bad trade-off in, in your case of a phone application. Right. It doesn't allow us to have the server running for a merchant, for example, that can just constantly have uh, inbound. It, it is more limited, but I think it's the right trade-off for a uh, end user, what you'd think of as an actual wallet in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, but, but to also put this in relation, right, is that uh, even right now, when you make a coin join, you do type in the password uh, upfront, Right, and then it is remembered by Wasabi or Chaincase for the duration of the coin join ceremony, yes. right? Until all of your coins have reached uh, the target anon set, um, yeah. And that's also, I think, the 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 extended master secret, right? So the the top secret that with whom you can spend all of your Bitcoin, I do believe that this is remembered in Wasabi whenever you make a coin join, right? So not just those coins that you uh, get for or that you actually intend to mix. Yeah, I think it has to, uh, because you need to derive, right, whatever output you end up getting from a coin join, if you want to remix that, you have to have the private key for it as well. Yes. Um, so we, we will see uh, how it evolves. Um, but I'm actually curious, because you are quite, of course, dependent on, on Wasabi, since you're using all, all, a lot of the Wasabi code. How... Have you experienced over the last well couple of years now the the research with Wasabi 2.0 and how you as a downstream user of Wasabi software um, like how are your feelings about you know being involved in it and the progress that has been made so far? I mean, it's wonderful to see the paper come out and the explainers and the improvements in the UI, even though Chaincase can't necessarily benefit from those directly. Um, I wish it was easier to follow the updates in, in Wabi Sabi because the complexity of the protocol is not simple to me. It's just not, it's not clear yet. Um, so even following that development, uh, I've been, I, I feel welcome. I feel involved, but I'm confused. Um, <laughs> and that's coming from someone who probably knows, well, you know, I'm probably in like the top 20 people who know about what's going on there. So it's just very complex. Yes, that's, that's quite true. Um, and it's, you know, it's conceptually very similar to zero link, which, and I would say zero link is very simple. Um, but you know, the nuances with it and the actual cryptography that's used is just a lot more complex 
if if you really want to truly understand it, which to be honest, I still don't. Yeah, I, I don't know that anyone but Adam and Lucas maybe know the, the whole shebang, the implementation. Maybe I'm missing someone. Someone someone's out there shaking their head. They're like, I know about this. You didn't mention me. I don't know. Maybe David knows about it too. Well, I'm I'm even quite certain that Adam is not as comfortable with the cryptography as with other parts of it. I mean, just because, well, he's not a wizard cryptographer. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough. Uh, but my bet would be actually on Yuval, nothing much. I mm. think he has the most sophisticated understanding of the whole, well, the, the whole process. I'd take that bet, yeah. He came out of nowhere, and he's just he's flying. I can't wait for Wabi Sabi and Wasabi 2.0, especially as a payment hub. If that happens, it will seriously change the way we think of on-chain privacy. Yeah, so what are your thoughts on then upgrading to Wasabi 2.0? Like, have you done some considerations on how much time it will cost you compared to, you know, getting, like, like to making a a minor upgrade that is not as big, right? If So if you upgrade, for example, from Wasabi 1.1.10 to 1.1.12, right? What is that upgrade process for you like? And how do you think that this major 2.0 upgrade process will be different? Yeah, it's hard to say. Well, it's still in flux. I'm not sure what the whole overhaul is. Um, hmm. it's, it's really hard for me to comment on that at all. Do you have an idea, Max? Do you... Do you know how much different wasabi 2 really is it seems to me that much of the coin control validation uh indexing blockchain logic is the same and it's it's mostly the coin join logic is and some tor logic as well that's changed um although it's well documented what do you think yeah so the blockchain synchronization is the same um the Tor implementation got a major refactoring. Uh, so this actually might be interesting for you to also then check how your changes to Tor, to, to make Tor work on iOS are affected by those refactorings. Uh, because I think they are essentially like needed. Um, just because with, uh, with Wabi Sabi, you create multiple Tor identities, not just for one user, but for every coin that you use, right? So a new Tor identity for each input that you register. Um, and this means that you have even more Tor identities running in parallel as you would have in a zero link coin join. And so there were more optimizations and parallelizations of the Tor process going on. I think that might be a big issue or one of the bigger issues. Um, and or that affect you directly. Of course, the cryptography is vastly, vastly different and quite a lot more complex. But I would guess that this is not really of a concern to you um, because you just use the Wasabi code, you know, out of the Wasabi library. Um, and, you know, that already now includes all the Wabi Sabi logic uh, or cryptography. So that hopefully, you know, other than making sure that it, it gets imported and used properly, the library, I hope that that would be rather smooth. Um, but I, and okay, and then to finally sum up, I think in the UX part, that also will require more consideration than just a naive upgrade, right? Simply because so many more things become possible, right? Like, um, for example, consolidating coins in a coin join uh, is now much more private than it used to be before. Um, and of course, no longer the minimum amounts and the standard denominations, right? But still, a uh, better privacy for being in a standard denomination and also the aspect that you can now hopefully make payments inside a coin join as well and even batching multiple payments in one single transaction um, all of this is quite a big general overhaul to the possible wallet experience and again i think here you can certainly further improve even more so than wasabi 2.0 does on desktop uh, just to you know, take it to the to the next step and make it even more intuitive and free flowing. Yeah, the tour stuff I have kept up with a little bit, fortunately, and I think because we're still using socks, that all of the wasabi code should be able to be used. So that's like sigh of relief to the users. I think. Yes. 
because <laughs> um, in the past it's taken it's taken about maybe eight to 20 man hours to do a port from an example 1.1.10 to 1.1.11 that you gave um because we're not using the rpc because we're essentially using uh, we're replicating the view models right we're just porting the view models um this is definitely technical for a lot of listeners i'm sure but instead of using an rpc server that's like a particular service which would require a forked process which like i said earlier we can't do uh with tor we run the wasabi code directly so whatever services within the code that have been uh exposed we can use the same way and they can even um be tested the same way um so that makes me that makes me hopeful that it, it, at least there will be a reference implementation in the Wasabi UI uh, in Avalonia that's quite similar um, to implement. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to, you know, UX improvements, that's a whole research topic that's going to be, I think, many years in the making. We'll have to see how Lightning plays out. We'll have to see how these um, side chains with DeFi play out, um, you know, getting into them. And, and getting out of them potentially with coin join um yeah it's who's to say yeah for sure there are a lot of still open questions and frankly quite a lot of work still to be done so how can people help you out at chain case what are some of the contributions that you would be eager to receive i'm glad you asked so right now we are really interested in the non-code contributions from users who outline why the app's not stable for them if it's not stable for them. Those go so far. I'd really love to thank all of our users who have had the patience uh, to adopt the app early, to get in the t.me slash chaincase telegram channel, um, giving feedback. It's just been like totally fabulous. Um, and then in the, in the actual code department, we've been fortunate or development department. We've been fortunate to work with the design community. I want to give a shout out to John Spahari, Ed Pratt, Stephen DeLorme, uh, and everyone else who has contributed the design to fixing the problems uh, with, with Bitcoin privacy. And those those contributions, you know, they, they I don't know that that will necessarily end. Privacy never, sorry, not privacy, software um, is never finished. So those contributions in coin selection and coin join and general guidance helping users make decisions um we're looking for those to continue and then just a uh, code review right now i'm working on a pull request to add the icloud backup and the metadata backup and um getting that reviewed getting that in there that's probably the thing we need the most help with um i've had a lot of help from andrew camilleri and Armin Saburi and Ben Carmen in the past. So yeah, shout out to those guys too. Um, and then when it comes to, I wanna, I wanna mention Lightning as well. There's um, Arvinda is helping us with, with, with Lightning design, but that's something I think we have to wait for the Rust Bitcoin library, the LDK to become more mature, but I would love to connect with people who know how to make that happen and how to integrate with our existing uh, coin data, blockchain data, broadcasting, you know, make it real. Yes, uh, I, Lightning, I mean, I'm excited about it for such a long time now. But, uh, you know, again, whenever I bring it up to Nopara, hey, let's, you know, let's do Lightning privately, then it comes up that, well, none of the current implementations has a holistic trade-off favoring privacy. You know, usually there just have to be other trade-offs in regards of, you know, stability, uptime, usability and such. Um, and it's just much, much, much more difficult to do it properly in a privacy-focused way. So using one of the existing clients, probably not possible, right? Uh, if you want to do it really hardcore private. So it has to be done by, well, yourself and writing a complete new lightning node. Well, good luck. Uh, that's going to take you some time and a lot, a lot of man hours. Um, so yeah, then hopefully with, I initially, I thought Blockstream, uh, Blockstream C Lightning, uh, with its more modular plugin architecture 
might be useful. Well, but actually Rust Lightning uh, is even more modular by design and hopefully can be adapted and, and fine-tuned in a way so that it actually does the privacy cautious trade-offs uh, in all aspects. Uh, so yes, that would be fantastic if hopefully soon in two weeks, uh, we get some lightning magic going in Wasabi and Chaincase. Yeah, it's a totally distinct feature set that still requires research, development, design, and testing. So I'm sure it'll come at some point, but man, it's a hard one. That's a hard problem. Yeah. You know, and uh, it, looking back, uh, we've been doing now for well over a year and a half research on Wabi Sabi CoinJoin specifically. And it's still not done uh, being implemented, right? We're still far away from release. Um, and, you know, as we said, CoinJoin is super simple. It really is one of the most simple Bitcoin protocols out there. Lightning Network is orders of magnitude more complex, right? So I'm thinking that even a five-year research and development process is or might be an understatement for an actually seriously privacy-preserving Lightning implementation. And that's just sad. Yeah, that's that's why I'm kind of surprised we haven't seen venture capital in the space because it's such a like hard tech moonshot business in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, well, what, what, how, what do you think about the financing of these free software projects? Uh, how is it done currently and, and how could it be done better? So I think we've seen uh like two totally distinct binary like either you're open source and you're working for the public or you're venture capital and the only thing you care about is profit and the true magic is going to happen where those things come together and that is in large part i think why wasabi and zk snacks has been so successful because in the early days i remember the um the greg maxwell bounty right like that was in, in a lot of ways, that was a community donation that uh, funded the project. Of course, it's been so uh, successful in, in creating something sustainable, but that's where, that's where the business component comes in. I think a lot of what you could call Bitcoin companies or Bitcoin projects have relied solely on donations and haven't been able to bootstrap sustainably. Um, and because Bitcoin and Bitcoiners are values-based and require these long time horizons. I don't know that that's, that uh, fits the traditional Silicon Valley uh, American mold, at least where you're trying to find product market fit as quickly at pos as possible at all costs, you know, just run straight towards uh, profit, build to sell or build to go public. I think it's more compatible with uh, a European model of a large private company that's you know operated by the founders but we shall see it's good that human rights foundation was able to raise so much money uh via strike at the indy 500 um i see ben price out there raising for open sats so it's evolving quickly and i'm excited yeah that's that's really fascinating and yeah those those free software grants, you know, from other cash flow heavy companies are very useful. Uh, but I'm, yeah, you know, a donation based uh, funding or project finance is very volatile and not as well, well as straightforward. And let's say the more classical way to do it is just to provide a service and get paid and out of that be profitable. Um, and I think we've seen that in, in three places so far, right? That in the Bitcoin ecosystem, first, it's running a mining pool operator, and right? that's a server that gets paid natively in Bitcoin um, for the software that they run and coordinate with. Then the next one is, of course, coin joins. And so this is, again, a, a service that is run by someone and, and that person gets paid for it. And finally, a lightning service provi provider well, products, uh, uh, they are a bit different because they actually have a capital cost um, in the sense of Bitcoin, uh, well, held in these payment channels. Uh, so in any case, 
you've actually exper experimented with running a coordinator for the chain case users. Um, and this has that optionality actually for you uh, to, to get paid. Now, what are some of your experiences uh, in this way of trying to get the project financed? Yeah, like we were talking about with uh, the background notifications, it's very difficult to coordinate uh, users with a, a finicky tour on iOS, or it hasn't been historically. I think it's getting better, but um, we're going to need to do, we're going to need to grow uh, or continue to grow in order for the business to be sustainable. And that's really my hope and uh, for the project to be sustainable. And I really do look at ZK Snacks as a, a model example of, how a Bitcoin company can function and thrive. Yeah, and I, I it's it's really a, a genius, uh, a genius model, but it very much depends on network effects uh, on on multiple levels. I mean, first of all, anonymity likes company, right? So you will only have a serious privacy if there are multiple users behaving the same way as you do including especially to to use the same coordinator as you do right so uh, and bootstrapping that initial network effect seems to be quite difficult um what do you think uh um like how how could that be improved what what are some things that could be done to make that bootstrapping process more quick I think the biggest issue is in the remixing it requiring you to be online is, is difficult. So users go to sleep and they don't remix overnight. Right. And then they don't come back to it, uh, until they get another email or another telegram chat telling them, Hey, don't, don't forget to coin join. So those two things, both reminders and, uh, being able to remix as well as growing the actual user base, lowering the bar of access, making it easier to use contribute to that bootstrapping yeah that's very true and there was always one one difference between wasabi and uh, chain case with that in wasabi on the desktop uh, you can uh, change the coordinator and the back end that is connected to well not easily in the graphical user interface but in the configuration file at least um, and of course by default it connects to the ck snacks coordinator uh, however, you can actually connect to the chain case coordinator too. Um, yet with chain case, uh, it was always just that default chain case coordinator um, and no way to changing it. Uh, what was the rationale of that? And where do you see that evolving in the future? Zero config is definitely the way to operate a successful mobile application that we've seen over and over again, uh, from, you know, signal and proton mail as good examples. But if it's something that is a hindrance or a request from users, I'd appreciate the inbound. I'd like to hear, uh, you know, if, if people want to do that, I, that's something that's a piece of feedback. I actually haven't heard from users yet. Yes. I see. Um, I'm curious because there are more. You know, there, if a user could connect to multiple coordinators and simultaneously, you know, find out if any of these coordinators have coin join rounds, uh, in negotiation right now, um, then uh, it might be, uh, or then it might be more optimal, you know, to get more privacy preserving opportunities. Right. So do you think it would be possible to connect to multiple coordinators and the client then picking which offered coin join configuration is more suitable? Yeah. What I learned this past weekend is that there are perhaps even more coordinators than are advertised or that we're aware of. So I think it would be possible in the future. And I'm interested to see what solutions come out to enable that. Yeah, that will be interesting. Um, I, th I think one of the differences and why I think what, like your choice of running your own coordinating server was a very good one is because the current zero link protocol puts a lot of the important decisions to the coordinator. Things like, for example, 
how many users have to be there at the minimum and at the maximum. Um, at what timeout do the coin joins always happen? Um, and of course, what are the standard denominations that are enforced for every user? Right? These are crucially important UX choices, and they will always or they will never be perfect for every user. Right? They will there will always be suboptimal, well, because they are enforced by the service provider and not chosen freely by the user. Uh, and of course, in, in Wasabi, that standard denomination is 0 0.1 Bitcoin, which by now is, well, a lot. <laughs> um, but with Chaincase, you could actually, by running your own coordinator, for example, reduce the minimum amount to 0 0.05 and to then also increase the timeout to, I believe, what, 48 hours or something? Uh, in between coin joins. So what do you think about this customization of the actual coin join role parameters? I think we also have to remember what was said earlier in that making the decision increases the cost of the transaction and the profit to the user. So it would be great for users to get what they want every time and in, in that they could, uh, they could decide exactly their parameters or just have the parameters they want without making a decision. But um, it doesn't seem realistic to me. Um, so like you said, coin join with chain case is uh, a million sats versus the zero, uh, the ZK snacks, 10 million sats. And it's something I think we're going to just have to still play with and find out what, um, what creates a critical mass of users for a sustainable product. I'm, I'm not certain that a million sats is even low enough. Uh, we're going to see it change with Wabi Sabi. And that may be the only way that we can uh, have a sustainable product. I'm not sure yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious how that will change with Wabi Sabi, uh, because here the coordinator is much more laissez-faire, so to say. Um, he no longer enforces maximum seven inputs or, uh, you know, everyone needs to have the 0 0.1 Bitcoin standard denomination. Um, and uh, a lot of a lot of other things are now possible to be decided by the client. And I mean the, the client software, right? I don't mean the end user facing yes. you know, entity. Um, so I'm curious how that will change the, the, well, the, the competition or the market, at least of those multiple coordinators, if different round parameters are no longer that much of a differentiating factor, because with Wabi Sabi, well, the client can choose how the round parameters would look for him. Yeah, who's to say? The future is bright in that regard. It's very exciting. I just don't know if we're going to be able to make sense of it as users, what's actually happening. That's one concern is like the auditability and making sure the client is behaving in our best interest. Yes, and whenever there are these automated demons running, right, and especially when there are coin joins happening by default in the background, yeah, there tend to be yeah, mistakes in the sense that the wallet does something that the user actually does not want to be done. So yeah, there are probably going to be a lot of more further questions and unsolved things on how to use Wabi Sabi oh, reliably under the hood so that one there is no configuration for the user and to privacy by default, right? For everyone, uh, yet still keeping that at a somewhat reasonable cost and doing it all quickly as well. Right there, uh, again, uh, we're fighting an impossible battle here on all fronts. I don't know about impossible. I'm very optimistic. I think, I think someone will fix it. <laughs> it may not be you. It may not be I or me. It may not even be uh, be Wasabi, but I really think if we're talking Bitcoin privacy that's accessible, it's solvable. Yes, I really tend to think so too. Uh, now, this is already a, a very uh, high, high note uh, to end it on, but do you have any more topics uh, about chain case or anything else that uh, you find so important that you just cannot keep the peers from receiving that information any longer? Mm. If people tried it a year ago, I'd ask them to try it again, because we've come a long way in stability and capability. And um, yeah, just let me know your thoughts and ideas. Um, 
yeah that's about it as it's it's really a shame man that i have still to this day not actually used chain case uh that that really pains my heart but well what do you do if you don't have an iphone i guess i gotta <laughs> send you an iphone <laughs> 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 but I'm not even sure if I want it. <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. No, but uh, I, seriously, I'm, again, absolutely impressed uh, with, with the work that you've done. Um, not just uh, is it always fun to prove you know, uh, people like Nupara um, just wrong with their statement that things are impossible. That's always very satisfying. <laughs> but then not just to prove that it, in fact, is possible, but that it is even possible to do it elegantly and beautifully, uh, that's that's just breathtaking. So you've done seriously a a marvelous job to get this technology rolled out into more um, more applications, more more platforms, so to say, um, so that now even users of a phone uh, can have extremely high network level privacy and on chain level privacy uh, for their Bitcoin. Uh, that that really is a monumental step. You've been really helpful in giving me a platform to speak about it and to share. So thank you, Max. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Pierce, uh, we're going to cut it off here uh, and stay tuned for all these future happenings at Chaincase. Uh, this is a marvelous Bitcoin wallet uh, that has done made the impossible possible. Uh, and there is, as you might have heard in this conversation, so much more and interesting things coming in the future uh, that, well, it is very bright. Um, I'm curious how we can further you know, improve and advance this. But one thing that for sure we need is your feedback, right? So go to chaincasewallet.com. Is that the correct domain? I have uh, it's chaincase.app. You can right. find us on Twitter, also at chaincaseapp on github chain case dash app and you can find me on twitter at dan gould dev yeah well Looking yes download, hearing from the, you. download the app get into the test flight uh and then try it out uh it's it's really something uh and it has even more potential uh, in the future so well what else could be exciting okay dan so thank you very much for joining me today here at the join the wasabi cast podcast uh, keep up the great work and talk to you on the next one. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.